Blizzard have cancelled two titles to redouble their efforts on two other titles, setting the stage for what could be the largest BlizzCon in years. Warcraft seems to be learning quite a bit, nerfing the Azerite grind to be more player friendly, as well as implementing a shiny new upgrade system. Hey everyone and welcome back to the news. Well, it was quite a week. This was initially a slow week until very suddenly it wasn't, with news breaking the Blizzard have cancelled a game. Then patch 8.2 is mostly on the PTR, and we actually have some really, really nice developments to round up, especially when they suggest that Blizzard is moving in a better direction with the design philosophy of World of Warcraft, which totally is something that we should be cheering on. Of course, it's a new month, and that does mean a new Patreon theme, so this month's theme, if I... Ah, can hold my hand, right? Okay, you know what, I'll hold them sensibly. So, we've got the big vinyl sticker, best dairy card, the A5, and uh, these are the best way to support the channel. It's 25 bucks, shipping included, and that, you know, means America and stuff as well. And uh, given the potential of a new adpocalypse coming, this stuff is more helpful than ever. And, uh, well, we finally got to the stage where actually I feel like we're, you know, we're getting some really good stuff out too, which is pretty darn great. So yeah, there's that. And also if you want more content in general, we are doing like two to three videos a day over on the news channel because it's E3 and stuff has been rather mental. But anyway, let's get into the news. And we're going to kick off affairs with Blizzard's Benthic gearing preview. This was a little while ago, but I think it's very important to talk about. There's a lot to read into with this, especially since Blizzard have built a new custom UI for it. And that really does make me think they could be kicking off a major mechanical test. One that would directly hit on a topic that I talked about in this channel's previous video, the concept of meaningful work. So, Bentha Gear is your open world content uh, gear progression and catch up system. Basically, uh, getting the Benthic gear at its low item level uh, is very easy, but it has this whole big upgrade system. It's a decently long haul as you collect mana pearls in Najatar. Now, what's interesting about this is that originally on the PTR, you would just purchase an item from a vendor, and, you know, you'd click on the item, you'd use it on the gear, and that would upgrade its quality. But they've since changed things to be a custom UI. And that's something that makes me think they are building a new system for these gear upgrades that they may want to reuse in the future. Now, the Mentha gear itself, while it's got many great qualities, it's got fixed stats, it's got some pretty cool secondary effects, and what's relevant to this video is that essentially, well, they're item upgrades. That's what they are. Now, sure, you don't upgrade them with valor points from dungeons or raids. Instead, it's mana pearls from Najatar content. But the concept is still, like, there. It still stands. There's zero RNG, and the basic bits of armor, i.e. the stat templates, are designed to be, um, you know, something you can get pretty easily, which mitigates the RNG issue. It's a pretty darn good system, from my view so far, and it quite clearly seems like an experiment. Just like with Mechagon versus Najatar. Again, two more experiments. We have not had a gearing system exactly like this in quite some time. And I mean, man, just compare this Benthic gearing system to the random gear tokens of Argus. It could not be more different, and this is way better. So seeing that, plus the big tasty new UI, gives me a bit of hope. It just seems like it's an experiment. And perhaps if this goes well, we could see it stick around for the future of BFA and then maybe even further into another expansion. Now, I very much doubt the Titan Forging would fully go away, but perhaps a system like this could be applied across gear in a way that I've suggested in the past. Having item upgrades act as, uh, you know, the, the default thing, so a system like this, but then Titan Forging just being you getting maybe, you know, some free item upgrades. Now, alternatively, you could just have a flat item upgrade system and then you could maybe give bosses the chance to drop upgrade currency instead of Titan Forging. That would give you a lot more control over your character's gearing path. Um, it would still allow Blizzard to do their sort of varied reward thing with Titan Forging, but I think that might be more engaging for more people and maybe would feel like a more fair system. Certainly, I'm very interested to see what, uh, really just how this plays out, what Blizzard are going to do with this, so it's definitely good to see. Anyway, next, let's talk about Heroic Warfronts. I've not got to test these yet, but they have been added to the PTR. Simply put, they're Warfronts, but they're tuned for item level 415 players, of course, in a pre-made group, and it basically just means that the enemies deal more damage and have a larger health pool. Wowhead pointed out that Slade has 6.4 million HP on the 20-player regular match-made Warfront, but 19.4 million HP on the Heroic mode with 16 players. Now, hopefully it, that doesn't make it a slog. It's just worth remembering that, of course, a Heroic pre-made will have far better gear and coordination. Uh, past that, though, the main difference is that the enemy commander will charge out, only retreating once they've been reduced to 60% health, so that could be a spanner in your works. 
Um, it would be interesting to see if they up the aggression of the enemy assault patrols spawning or just do things like that to change up the gameplay. I mean, overall, it seems like a perfectly fine update. Uh, I'm sure Heroic Stromguard will be worth doing for the 425 of the Quest Nats, but I just don't really see Blizzard tuning it to be hard enough for the gameplay to be that thrilling. I'll reserve judgment until I actually get hands-on, but still, I kind of feel like Warfronts are a bit of a wash and they're probably not worth that much dev time at this stage. Anyway, next, we do have an Azrite update from the PTR. This is a pretty great one. It really is. Blizzard have doubled the Azerite rewards from Emissary Quests to 3,000, up from 1,500, and they've also increased the Island Weekly by 1,000. Now, this isn't me being happy that they've, you know, that they've given us more free stuff. Um, I think this is actually quite major for the average player, and the bit that matters for me is that it greatly reduces the amount of time needed to stay on top of the Azerite curve, or the AP curve. Now, since it, of course, drops every week with knowledge, um, personally, I've stayed at about where it would cost me 10,000 right AP to get my next HOA upgrade. And don't worry, I know that's really lazy, but yeah, getting 10,000 Azerite, that's going to involve doing like two to three emissaries a week now, like half as much as, as previously. And yes, that does seem like I'm just happy because the thing that I do is easier, but I think actually what matters here is that you've got to remember this is done for patch 8.2. 8.2 has a lot more progression, right? So you're going to be hunting down your essences for the Heart of Azeroth. You're going to be going through your Najatar content. You'll be spending time in Mechagon. Doing all of that stuff is going to take a lot of time. And keeping up with the Azerite system on top of that, well, I think that would be too much busy work. I think that this new stuff replaces that sort of Azerite or, you know, AP grinding with stuff that's more fun. So I think this is a really good change. I don't think the AP upgrades right now are driving that healthy gameplay habits. So I think that easing up on that uh, in order to let people feel like they can do Mechagon and Najatar, which are higher quality content, I think that's a good move. Maybe it hints that the next expansion will ease up on stuff like AP, perhaps more focusing on the opt-in, player-driven progression, with, say, the excellent Mechagon being an example. Next, we've got Blizzard's cancelled game. Now, I recorded this section earlier, so you know what? We're just going to cut to that, and if you enjoy stuff like what you're about to see, uh, do consider checking out our second channel, where, uh, I mean, yeah, spicy titles and thumbnails, because that's just how you have to play the game these days, unfortunately, but we pretty much do what you're about to watch, like, four to seven times a week, sometimes more, and we also just passed 100,000 subscribers over there, so, uh, yeah, it's going from strength to strength, it's E3 season, there'll be a lot of content there over the next uh, few days, so, um, yeah, with that, enjoy the sudden change in clothing, and let's get into it. So, last night, Kotaku's Jason Schreier released a report stating that Blizzard have cancelled a shooter set in the StarCraft universe. Now, not that Jason needs backed up, but I can confirm this story through my own sources. I've kind of known a bit about this for a few months at this stage, and uh, I've heard a little bit about how this project has also impacted the state of Overwatch and its sequel. Now, Schreier spoke to three sources familiar with the matter. They told him that the StarCraft Warcraft shooter was called Ares, that was its project name, and that it has been in development for the last two years. Now, this perfectly lines up with what I have heard. So, I was told the Blizzard's other shooter project took away resources from Overwatch, that it partially contributed to the slow-ish development pace of Overwatch, and that it also slowed down the development of Overwatch 2. Now, Jason's sources tell him, as mine did, that Overwatch 2 is a PvE game, so something very different to the current PvP game of Overwatch, likely, of course, building off the brand recognition and the story teases that Blizzard have been, uh, you know, weaving through for the last few years. And of course, it would be in a, a game in addition to Overwatch, not one that would replace it. There is a little bit more that I can say here, but I think it'll be a little bit too revealing, uh, even though there's a decent chance that I ended up talking to the same people that Jason did. Uh, really, though, all I can sort of do here is say, I've heard the same stuff that he has. Uh, that's like, I think Jason's report is basically completely on the money, and I've kind of heard about this for months. Now, this all does make sense to anyone who's actually been paying attention to Overwatch. Development for that game has been very slow, with the skins being kind of farmed out to contract art houses in uh, cheaper countries. That's not to diss the work in those skins. Actually, Overwatch's skins are um, really quite gorgeous. That's at least what I've heard about the development stuff there. Now, from what I understood, resources were somewhat split between Ares and Overwatch 2, which, again, kind of lines up with what Jason has reported. And then something that lends credence to the uh, resource problem is that recently a Blizzard animator who has left the company called 
David Gibson posted on Twitter that it was his last day at Blizzard and that he said it was unfortunate that we'll never see what he had been working on for the last two years, but that he'll always have Overwatch. And then he linked his Overwatch showreel. So I think it's pretty darn clear. Now, why did all of this stuff happen? Well, we get a pretty darn clear picture from Jason's report. Blizzard, of course, built a brand new engine from scratch for Overwatch. Now, an engine is not just a one-shot asset for a single game. It's a selection of tools that are reusable. For an example, my own studio, we have begun, uh, you know, building common tech that we'll be working on or that we're using for our current game, but is very, very much designed to be usable on our other projects and to speed them up. And in the process, saving us a whole bunch of time, and that means a whole bunch of money. It's the smart thing to do. And, uh, you know, it's just like that for Blizzard, but at a massive scale where you're dealing with millions and millions and millions of dollars. So the Overwatch engine, that was developed by Blizzard with the intent to use it for future projects, seemingly including Overwatch 2 and the new StarCraft shooter. Now, this shooter was supposedly headed up by Dustin Browder, the director of StarCraft 2, who then went on to lead the um, now rather gutted Heroes of the Storm. According to Jason, this project was supposed to be essentially just the next game in the StarCraft universe, keeping that universe sort of taken forward, pushing it forward, something I'll get into later. Now, he reports that the project's cancellation actually came at a great surprise to its team. Now, it's kind of interesting. I heard from a source that the project was really quite cool and quite promising. Jason's sources have a more mixed take. One said the development was slow, and then, of course, the other said that it came as a massive shock to the team, so clearly the team were feeling pretty confident about it. Now, Kotaku said that nobody was laid off as a result of this, so that Blizzard animator who I mentioned uh, earlier in this video, he probably just changed jobs in light of his project being cancelled, which is a pretty reasonable thing to have happen. Now, the team were told that the project was axed in order to free up more development resources for Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4, which are set to be this year's BlizzCon headliners. Now, it's pretty clear that those projects are both running behind schedule. A source told me that Overwatch 2 at one point was planned for BlizzCon 2018, and that Diablo 4 was also planned. Now, my own sort of take on that is that I suspect Overwatch 2 was delayed a lot earlier on, and the Diablo 4 was a very late-in-the-day cancellation for that BlizzCon. Regardless, though, it left them with Diablo Immortal as their headliner, which, of course, damaged their reputation greatly. And uh, actually, on that, we have a little bit more mobile news in a bit. Overall, this is going to have BlizzCon 2019 being one of the largest BlizzCons ever. Unless the next WoW expansion is announced at Gamescom, well, we'll probably have the next WoW expansion. And do note that World of Warcraft is probably the single largest game amongst BlizzCon attendees. A lot of guilds go there and meet up, so there'll be a WoW expansion, there'll be Overwatch 2, and there'll be Diablo 4. That is a really, really thick BlizzCon. As for the mobile games, well, Blizzard have also, at the same time, cancelled a mobile game. Again, with the reasoning being to shift resources over to Diablo 4 and Overwatch, according to Jason's report. And yes, through this, it does mean you can deduce that the mobile projects were taking up time from developers who could otherwise be working on PC and console games. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Developers are a limited resource within a company, and with common tools like the Unity game engine, which is example uh, what Hearthstone and probably their other mobile projects um, run off, but, you know, devs are a limited resource. They can work on a lot of different projects. It's pretty clear that uh, devs working on a mobile project can also work in a PC and console project. I mean, come on. Now, we've got no idea what this mobile uh, project that was cancelled is. We do know that Corey Stockton was heading up a Pokemon Go-inspired WoW project, and that there are a number of other mobile projects uh, there across a few different genres. But unless Jason shares anything else, we're not really going to have any more information on that. Diablo Immortal is a slightly different kettle of fish, though. It's a development that is primarily, I believe, being developed uh, in China, quite clearly for China, by Natties. So it likely would not really be taking away development resources in the same way that an internally developed mobile project would. Now, with all that said, what was Ares actually like? Well, it was reportedly Battlefield in the StarCraft universe, according to one of Schreier's sources. Prototypes would let you play as a Terran Marine, with there being um, plans for playable Zerg as well. We don't really know that much past that, though. Um, I do personally wonder if it was similar to Command & Conquer Renegade. Indeed, Renegade X is actually a remake of that game that released into beta in 2014, so that could have served as a bit of an inspiration. But anyway, it's really hard to know past that. So. 
To cancel games. Is this indicative of Blizzard being bad? Is it blowing up? Is, is Blizzard dead? No, not really. Uh, games get cancelled all the time. They get cancelled far more than you'd think. Uh, every game that launches, that contributes to survivor bias. We only see the games that successfully release. For the most part, of course, we do hear about dead projects. But that means that it looks like the chances of success are higher than they actually are. And this is an effect that can really set an unhealthy expectation amongst both newbie developers and uh, customers. In reality, something like this is a totally normal thing to happen. If development of Ares was going slow and the company felt like they really needed to progress over Watch 2 and Diablo, then it's pretty reasonable to pull staff off the less positive looking projects and onto the more positive looking ones. After all, are people not quite critical of Blizzard for not supporting Overwatch that much and for neglecting the Diablo franchise? They are, so something like this helps those franchises and does make a good bit of sense. Indeed, this report even suggests that they're pulling developers off a mobile project and onto two PC and console projects. And I think that is exactly what most of the core audience would actually like to hear. I think that's a decision that most people would like to have made. Now, all of that said, I'm left feeling a little bit mixed as a near lifelong player of the StarCraft franchise. Of course, we lost StarCraft Ghost way, by, way, way, way back in the day. I mean, StarCraft 2 is pretty much my favorite Blizz game, and actually, from what I hear, it's in a really healthy state in terms of its profitability. But that said, RTSs, they're not really an in-genre these days, and StarCraft 2 does the job just fine. They did attempt to keep its story going with the Ghost mission pack, but that didn't really seem to perform that well because they haven't done any more of them, and they shifted the monetization over towards co-op commanders and cosmetic additions. I suppose it does have me worry that the StarCraft franchise will be left a little bit dead. Who knows, I mean, StarCraft 3 certainly could emerge in a decade. Uh, it's never really been a franchise that's had a super fast release schedule, that's for sure. Overall, though, I can understand why the initial knee-jerk response towards this would be, like, negative towards Blizzard. But really, I think it's just a peek into how the sausage is made. At the end of the day, they're in the business of making games. If one project is having slow progress and it's holding back two really solid bets, two projects that'll definitely do well, it makes a lot of sense to do what they did. Harsh as it may sound, the same logic also applies to Heroes of the Storm. As much as I disagree with how Blizzard dropped support for that game so quickly and how they strung along teams and kind of messed up its esports ecosystem, well, again, from what I hear, that game was in a pretty bad state in terms of its revenue, like it was the lowest of the modern Blizzard titles. And it makes sense to pull devs away from that and onto other projects, ones that could be more promising. We'll still need to wait and see what this new era of Blizzard's going to look like. It's probably going to have them being a little bit more cutthroat in projects, maybe a renewed focus on just getting content out there. It really has been a rough few years for them. They dropped the second D3 expansion, even though Reaper of Souls basically saved that game. They cancelled the first version of Diablo 4. World of Warcraft's had a pretty troubled time recently. Overwatch has, um, well, stagnated massively, as has Hearthstone. But change does not come quick in the game industry, with two years being a fast development cycle. The fruits of whatever they're trying to plant right now, they're, they're not going to bear for a while. Of course, I do want them to do well. I do wish them the best. But the one thing I will say is I'm a little bit worried about monetization and a little bit worried about that Blizzard quality and Blizzard polish kind of diminishing if they really, really feel like they have to get a lot of stuff out there pretty quickly. I mean, I look at the monetization of Hearthstone, which is a pretty expensive game to keep up to date with. I look at what Overwatch did for loot boxes. And then I look at Activision's Call of Duty Black Ops 4, which has a lot of issues really deep issues in terms of its monetization. And that does make me worried about the overall company. But assuming they don't fall into those many pitfalls, like, yeah, we do want more Blizzard content to come out. And it does seem like this is a pretty reasonable way for them to double down on Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2, which I think we can all agree are pretty solid bets and definitely are games that people do want to see. And now we're back to me being, well, dressed up in the same colors as my sofa. So there we go, a massive big chunk of Blizzard news, but World of Warcraft news that honestly, yeah, it's a little bit slow, but I think it's moving in a good direction. And uh, that's pretty major for, for me.
There's not been a lot going on with Wowlis recently, though, bar the lore. Um, so E3 has been a pretty large focus. That means we'll have a lot on the other channel. Uh, with lore, though, I'm actually working right now on three different lore videos. It's been a little bit slow progress on them. I'll admit we should have one of them up pretty darn soon. So yeah, just look out for the lore stuff over the coming weeks. And it's kind of funny. We were ready to do three videos a week again on the Warcraft channel uh, as of last week. But then when it came to doing the news show, there just wasn't any news to talk about. So that was a little bit unfortunate. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit ticked off that we've not been able to get more content out for the WoW channel, but I still feel like we've been able to put out good content when we do. Uh, but still, we're really getting close to the time where the 8.2 guides are going to be more of a factor. We do have the patch retrospective series that we actually have been working on quite a bit, but we're just trying to nail down the format, which has taken longer than I would like, but that should be a pretty cool a uh, pretty, uh, pretty cool format. And then there's actually a retrospective into WOD that I've um, actually started working on in January, but uh, stuff just kept on getting in the way of it. So there's quite a lot coming, but uh, yeah, anyway, there's more stuff on this channel soon next week. There's a pretty juicy lore video that I think you'll enjoy a lot, but then a lot of E3 content over on the Variety Gaming channel. So thank you very much for watching this video. Be sure to check that out. And with all that, I will see you next time.